Hi, thank you everybody for joining us today. This is the 2021 Food Safety Showcases brought to you by the Food Safety Network and FPSA. I want to thank all of you for joining us today. Our, our speakers today are Nehemiah White. He's the Market Manager for DeVille Technologies, and he's going to be moderating today's session. Also speaking today is Peter Rasmussen, Industry Segment Specialist from Festo USA. Uh, gentlemen, I'm going to toss it to you now. Elena, I appreciate it. Thank you very much uh, for the quick introduction and thank you to those of you who have joined us today. Um, I appreciate you taking the time uh, from your day. Our days are very, very busy. So hopefully today's presentation and discussion uh, will prove some fantastic value for you that will multiply the time that you've spent on this webinar. Um, as Elena mentioned, I am uh, with DeVille Technologies. I'm a market manager uh, specifically for pet food and prepared foods and um, have really been had the opportunity to engage in some of these higher level hygienic design conversations, particularly around what innovations are happening. Um, my, our friend Peter here has had some opportunities to engage specifically on some of the uh, regulation specific innovation side of things. And um, Peter being a kind of bakery industry segment specialist for Festo has agreed to walk us through some of the, the, the uh, Harpsy regulation um, and how that applies maybe in our industry. Some, I guess some creative ways to think about it as well as some creative innovations with the within the industry, both general and then specific to what Festo has uh, come up with. My first question for you, Pat, Peter, and just by the way, as a side note, um, for those of you listening uh, and watching, apologies for the for no uh, no webcams. Uh, we're we're not trying to hide ourselves. There was a little bit of a te technical glitch today, so um, if you'd like to look us up on LinkedIn and have our picture pulled up there, so that it's not as much of an out of body experience, <laughs> feel free to. <laughs> but uh, for the moment, we'll go ahead and wrap in, Peter. And uh, my first question to you, Peter, would be this. What is, uh, you know, we, we, we've, there's a lot of conversations around sanitary design, hygienic design, particularly over the last 10 to five to 10 years with a number of different industry segments um, doing some specific work there. Uh, when it comes to bakery, what is, where does hygienic design, where is sanitary design stand on the priority for the bakery industry in general? Yeah, first of all, Jeremiah and Elena, thank you so much for, for having me on this 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 webinar. Um, it is definitely a, a topic that is near and dear to my heart. A couple less than five years ago I was in the bakery environment as a as an engineer on various roles. So so had some hands-on experience and now working as a component supplier, I get to help solve a lot of these problems that, that was identified or is identified generally in, in the industry. And so Jeremiah, to, to your question, uh, in terms of prior, priority when it comes to food safety, I will say that the priority is high, right? but we also have to be aware that it might not be to the same expectations and levels that you might see in other food industries, such as the dairy industry or specifically in the meat industry. I specifically don't recall ever having an FDA person in, in the bakery on a daily basis. And they are starting to show up to bakeries on, on, on announced and unannounced audits. Um, so it's so it's something that we need to continue to focus on for sure, but we also need to be aware of some of the best practices that are already developed in other industries so we can close the gap if there is a gap or at least um, make sure that the baking industry doesn't uh, doesn't maintain a lower expectations that you will see in other baking industry in other food industries. In food industries, that's really helpful to understand. Uh, I guess the degrees uh, how different it is compared to other industries is really helpful uh, because sometimes if we don't see the same focus on it or the same type of focus, sometimes we can uh, fool ourselves into thinking that it's not as as important. But understanding that there's different levels of of uh, I guess focus on any particular topic is really helpful. Now you mentioned that the like how we implement general hygienic standard standards within the bakery industry specifically are very important. And I think you're gonna get into this, some of that. But first, 
also, clearly as your uh, your first slide points out, you're going to touch on the the Harp C process and regulations and how that how that um, applies to specifically to bakery um, before we get to some specific innovations. Can you go ahead and jump into that and kind of give us some some perspective? Yes, yes. So so the way we typically look at the Harp C in the food in festival festival world is we, we put it under the new Food Safety Modernization Act. Um, the big change there was with this new legislation was to focus on prevention. So now when you are when you see a risk, you have to fix it and you have to monitor it and then verify it works. The key part here is when you see it. Uh, in the past, it was it was it was a little bit more. Um, it wasn't as strict when it comes to that. Like now, when you see it, it's your duty to make sure that you go out and fix it, and not just record it and then get to it later. No, you have a, you have a, um, uh, you you have to. I mean, you this, by the law it says that you can't just sit the back and be like, oh, I didn't know about this. Um, so that's that that's really a way that we as Festo also looks at. Okay, what can we highlight um, in the baking industry based on some of these new regulations, but also what what products that we as a component supplier when it comes to anything auto, automation, how can we help? How can we help identify some of these hazards? So um, you as a as a as a plant manager or as a food safety manager, it doesn't all fall on you. Uh, we we have a lot of knowledge um, when it comes to to the food industry. We are the world's largest automation component supplier to the food. Uh, industries, so we have a lot of background to to follow up on and and best practices to utilize, and that's that's where, with the hope of this presentation, we can give you guys some food for thought. You guys go back to either your pr production facilities, or if you are looking at buying new machineries, there's some really really simple things that just almost I did, like I eliminate some of these uh, hazards just from the get go, and that's what my goal is today to to bridge some of those um, best practices with the audience. Okay, that's that's really helpful. So I think what was really helpful is you uh, expressing particularly that the, the HARP-C is specifically based around uh, uh, prevent, pre preventative yeah. controls. So Perfect. preventative ma measures, um, which is sounds really similar to a lot of what FISMA has done and what maybe a lot of the industry has done um, with some of their standards that they've put out that uh, focus on preventative controls around design. Does that sound a little bit accurate? Yes, yes. Um, I, I have a slide uh, in the next, next coming up where it shows just how small this little piece that we're going to talk about is, um, is in the whole scheme of Food Safety Modernization Act. I mean, we as Festo are obviously looking on a component level. There's more to it than just components, of course, because this is food that consists of ingredients, et cetera, and, and, and how to ship it properly. And this is not an area where Festo can offer um, advices, but everything, when you look at it, is based on prevention. It is not reaction, it's prevention. Okay, that's that's really helpful to understand. It gives us a baseline. Um, I think that uh, Peter, you have some you, you have some uh, kind of a really robust layout of of specific components that um, have been identified specifically within the bakery world that um, are are major I guess candidates for innovation and where Festo has done some specific innovation. Um, would you like to? I'd, I'd like to go ahead and just kind of turn it over to you to. Um, touch on anything left over from the from the regulation side and jump yeah. into where where we're innovating where you're seeing innovation generally in the industry and then specifically at festo yeah yeah so so i'm going to go quickly through the first couple of slides here just we already kind of highlighted them but just showing here we today we're talking about the equipment and utensils under the food safety modification title 21 part 117 um we Together with Nehemiah and I, we just talked about there's a lot of a lot of focus on the prevention. So in going from should and wording from should to may to shall and must, and that is really the the key change here, especially when it comes to um, components levels. So before we get into the actual details, I just wanted to make sure that I highlight this because this is one of the big changes, especially for the guys on the call here. 
they might have machines going overseas or, or if you are overseas and you try and get into the North American market, there is actually differences when you look at what is food contact services. Uh, the new Food Safety Modification Act focuses mostly on what can happen during normal operations, while Europe focuses on if it can like, happen at all. I want to keep that keep that in mind as we go through this presentation because I'll reference to a couple of scenarios where we talk about food context surface and keep in mind that that can be a difference in way like North America and Europe looks at it, but uh, it's it's critical to know that there are differences. Uh, so today, like we will talk about the deep equipment and utensils, just to give you an overview of what it all includes. Um, we'll jump straight into it for the first part, which is design of plant equipment and utensils. Um, the big change here is that all all the components that you pick and choose for your your design and and uh, uh, equipment and utensils. Sorry, jump too fast. Um, they must they must be easy to clean. Uh, they must all like if you know there's some key words here. It must be designed so that uh, of such materials of workmanship be edible, cleanable. Um, it can be as simple as as in this case tubing. Um, is that tubing actually fitted? Uh, is actually like allowed in the food facility? So like if you have some tubing in in like you have an airline running in, in, in the bakery and that, that tubing is hanging above uh, a food zone and you're power washing that food zone, is that tubing actually able to hold like hold the, the all the chemicals? Like is it cleanable, so to speak, that it doesn't leach out any chemicals when you are cleaning it? Uh, you do not want any of these materials leach, leaching into your product. Um, that is that is a key point. It's a very simple point. I mean, to, how many of you would think about tubing as a food safety risk? But it's a very critical point because we all are using tubing in the facilities. So there is there is a, a very easy way to think going to your food plant and looking at your your machine design. I mean, is those tubings, um, is those utensils and equipment actually designed to be in a in a food environment? <clears throat> the next item that, that I want to talk about is the design and the construction and the use of the equipment and utilities. So in the picture here, you can see this is a food grade machine, silicone grade. Uh, most people would probably never ask questions. Why is that sitting on on this machine and, and what is it doing there? And, and that's because it's been a best practice for a while to have food grade silicone grease that you either use to lubricate, let's say you have a, a chain or, or, or whatnot in the facility. In this case, this picture is taken from a brewery. Um, so we're not just affected in the baking industry, but also in the brewing industry. Uh, but nobody would actually ask that question. What is, what is it doing there? Uh, and that's because it's been seen as a normal, normal, normal standard. But when it comes to your, your cylinders, how many of you have actually thought about the cylinders that's mounted above your food zone? And if, if that cylinder has any sort of lubrication inside of it, what is that lubrication? Is that FDA approved materials? Is it edible grease and such? And that's one of the things that we find um, with the new, the new rules here is, is simple thing is just like a cylinder mounted above a food zone. We all seen depositors that might deposit some product and it could be a linear, actuator or some sort that's above the food zone um, that could potentially drop that that grease that is on the shaft could potentially drop into to your product um, in this case uh, festo does have multiple offerings when it comes to this we actually have a full stainless steel cylinders on your left but we also have the stain like a round body and we have a stainless square body um, that is a, a ionized aluminum if you're not in a high intensity washdown area but that is that is some of those uh, mind thinkers that we would that we as Festo help to uh, want to help uh, machine builders but also um, producers to be aware of because this is a very simple one that could could get you in a lot of a lot of trouble for example the cylinder you see on the right it it's it's again in a brewery um, but there is open containers that flow below the cylinders and who would and this is by the way the cylinder is mounted 10 feet up in the air so nobody would ever walk by and just look into and see if the cylinder is, is leaking, but there's open product running right below it that could potentially get some um, some contamination um, just from if it wasn't had the proper uh, uh, grease in there, then that contamination could lead to people getting 
getting sick. Now going further so into more of the installation and the maintenance of the equipment. Um, again, the, the key word here is equipment must be installed to facilitate the cleaning and maintenance of equipment in adjacent spaces. Now, what, is, what does that all mean? Um, that means, sorry, I need to change slide here. Oh, that means that simple things as the radii, when you have any sort of uh, connections of materials, in this case, we're looking at maybe a stainless steel machine, that radii has to be larger than three millimeter um, to to allow to not allow particles and, and items to to sit and and not be clean. I mean, we all know if you have a sharp 90 degree, it's really hard to get in completely and and get all the dirt out. Having a radii larger than nine uh, three millimeters allows you to ease the cleaning up uh, ease of cleaning. Uh, also, not having any cavities, as you see on the right side, where materials can sit and build up over time and uh, just simple, uh, simple cleaning um, would be would not be enough. So when that comes to to components level in in the automation world, what does that that mean? And in, in Festo, we we have multiple um, items to fit this what we call clean design. So you you've seen some of our cylinders already uh, in the previous, which is the round body and the square body. All those have been designed with the mindset of not having cr uh, crooks and crannies. So when you take and wash it down, all the water would fall off. It doesn't allow it to sit in certain places where um, if you didn't come back and, and wipe it down and the water would become stale and potentially be an area for growth. Um, it also in fact impacts our, when, our valve series. So in the picture here, you see our, our standard valve series, but it's encased in a, in a, a special protection um, we call this series the MPAC was actually designed to be mounted right at the point of use on your machine it can it can withstand uh, IP69K uh, uh, washdown so you can use your chemicals you can power wash as long as you, you would like and you would never actually put their the electronics and the valves inside at risk the key, <clears throat> excuse me the key here is that no matter how you turn this this valve manifold you will always have the ability to water to run off. The picture doesn't quite give you the, the idea, but when when you get to hold one in your hand, there is no flat surfaces. However, how you mount is always a smooth radii. There's always a slanted uh, slope to to the to any surface. So if when it's mounted in the uh, in a washdown environment, you you that water will always run off. There are a couple of benefits of mounting uh, uh, a valve like this in right at point of use. Um, it is very costly today to get a cabinet where you typically would mount valves in there. They tend to get bigger and bigger as, as the industry moves to electrical automation that requires uh, servo drives, et cetera. So taking the valve bank out and putting that clone at point of use uh, can really help you reduce the size of your, your uh, cabinet. But also some energy savings just because you are actually filling less tubing with air because um, you are closer to the point of use. So this is the product that we see as a key player going forward in the baking industry. We know there is a trend to go closer and closer to washdown uh, or higher higher washdown requirements. This product can handle it. There is also a big focus on re uh, reducing compressed air consumption as much as possible. So mounting this close to the point of use uh, and proper sizing of tubing, you can actually in a, a, a add some energy savings to this, and uh, not just food safety. So Peter, just a quick question on that. So this comes to, to, I guess, the bodies, how you construct the bodies of your components um, so that they could be mounted anywhere on the machine and still maintain a hygienic standard regardless of where they are, because they're going to be washed wash down. They're not going to have nooks and crannies that are going to build up product. Um, and they're going to save a lot of room and in kind of in your control panel areas. Is that right? Yes, that, that's correct. So, so this is a polymer base. Um, that is uh, that has been designed to to meet those washdown requirements. But the theory is there is to, without adding additional uh, costs, try to to increase the amount of food safety we can offer the uh, the industry and and make okay. sure that that um, 
not only are we are we food safe, but we also try to minimize other component causes. This is a, this is a, a consumption of air, but also um, a cabinet. Sure. Very good. Okay. And go ahead and uh, I, I think you have a few a few more um, specific examples yes. around some of these innovations. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so the next one is kind of uh, an easy one. I mean, we we all everybody know that anything that comes in food contact has to be cleanable. So, using materials that can be clean, such so as the best practice right now is stainless steel. We as Festo are experimenting with um, anodizing of aluminum that gives you the same washdown capabilities um, as stainless, but lower cost. Uh, what's unique to Festo, we we offer all our our testing and and, and material um, like like material information to all our customers. So if they are going through an audit and 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 a customer uh, audited auditor asks for what is this component made out of, we can provide that right away. That's one of the things that we see as a key player to make sure that a key factor to make sure that we incre uh, increase food safety awareness and at all levels. Um, Corrosion resistance, uh, there's just some pictures of it. I mean, here you see uh, some of our cylinders mounted in in, a, in the environment. The one on the right is is kind of a nice show that with the proper materials in the, in the in a harsh environment, you can actually still maintain cleanability and such. I mean, this one's on a, on a bleach line. It's been there for six months. It gets sprayed with bleach every single day, uh, but you wouldn't be able to see it uh, just from, from normal operation. Um, the next here is the food contact surface and non-toxic material. It kind of dips into the same same idea that we talked about the materials being made of, like what is actually some of the non-metal materials made out of. So, so in this case for a, a cylinder, every single cylinder has a little uh, gasket in the front. We call it the scraper or, or seal, sealing options. Um, if you are mounting above uh, um, a food zone again, that material, if you're not careful, and if it's not picked, chosen for the right uh, application, that material could actually deteriorate if you're using chemicals. And if it just starts deteriorating your above food zone, that material could fall into your product and therefore expose the risk to the customer. Uh, we have we have the ability to actually put in these, these, these seals and scrapers that are uh, FDA approved materials. Just to give you a quick overview where some of these uh, seals can get can be attained in so anywhere from your standard round body cylinder aluminized to all the way up to your 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 square rotted um, stainless steel we can we can offer we can offer these these uh, scraper materials. One other thing that's that is a very easy easy way uh, to eliminate um, potential hazards is just simply by picking a cylinder that is designed with the clean and the, uh, design in mind. So maintains, maintenance of food contact surfaces, that means that once you put something in, it has to be easy to keep clean. Uh, Festo has developed, uh, I assume, I'm, I'm taking the assumption that most people know on the call how a cylinder works, that you exp apply some, some, some compressed air, which is your energy source, and you extend or retract the cylinder. And you can, there, you can also make some adjustments with a, with a needle nose to control the flow. It's useful when you're moving large objects or high speed. Um, we have developed to get that, we call it soft cushioning. So like you don't just slam the cylinder into, into yeah, slam itself into pieces. And uh, typically that was constructed with the help of a, of a needle nose where you're capturing some of the air and you're making adjustment and you would need a screwdriver. Festo has completely removed the need for that screwdriver adjustment, and now the cylinder does it by itself inside the cylinder. There's no mechanical moving pieces. There's nothing to wear. But the beauty is that you will see there's one, that little screwdriver slot is a great place for, what, I mean, flour, dirt, dust, whatever can build up. And if you, if once you've made that ad adjustment, you rarely would ever go back and make more adjustments. So it's an area that never gets a lot of attraction or activity. So that material can really build up for, for a while. With this new design from Festo, we call it the self-adjusting cushion. You don't have that adjustment point. So therefore it's a flat surface. If you look at the picture on top to the picture below, you can see there's a lot less nooks and crannies again, where materials can, can build up. 
a very easy one to to implement right away um that we offer this in all us like most majority of our cylinders but if you already are using a festo cylinder swapping is or is as simple and just giving a call to festo and we can we can help uh, the performance all stay the same um, we offer this this technology in, in a wide variety of our pneumatic cylinders so going into seams, it's kind of kind of back, uh, piggybacking off what I just talked about, that there should not be any nooks and crannies in any of these cylinders or any of these uh, components that you are in the food environment. There must be so there must be smooth or, or there must be so that they can be cleaned very easily. Um, you see some of the comments that FDA has provided that it's either through design or through maintenance that you keep these clean. Uh, at Festo, one of the things that we like to highlight to customers, the simple thing is the fitting that you use on your on your uh, machine can be a place where it, if you choose the right one, cleanability can be very easy obtained. You don't need additional maintenance, but if you choose the wrong one, this might be an area where you need to spend additional time to make sure that no buildup happens. So what, are, what does that all mean in, in, in general terminology? It means we tend to offer, we tend to prefer to offer our customers uh, straight fitted fittings with a actually included gasket as you can see in the pictures on the right the straight threaded fitting we call g-thread is able to seal completely against the material you're sealing against there's no way for any sort of materials to get inside between the gasket and the fitting and, and potentially have a place for growth whereas you look on the left side where it's a normal npt fitting with some npt tape on it um, by design a tapered threaded fitting will leave some threads exposed uh, just because the way that this is how it seals against your, your material well that's an area for bacteria or whatever to to uh, sit and grow and especially if you are in an environment where you can't have any other uh, foreign objects this and depending on what kind of uh, pipe tape you're using that pipe tape could come off and, and potentially uh, provide a food risk uh, the picture on the left is is an example of that you can actually see that there are some some pipe tape at the bottom that is about to to drop and we all know which way it'll go it'll go down because of gravity uh, so very very simple thing but very very easy thing to to fix um and it can have a big uh, impact on on your uh, number of risk that you'll see in a facility um, there are additional components, there are additional benefits with a, with a straight thread versus a, a taper thread. You could actually get a much closer seal um, so you don't have any air leaks. So there's a little bit of air, save, air savings there. And if you are in an environment where you need to replace, uh, remove and, and install um, fittings often, um, a, a straight thread is way more preferred because you're not actually continuing to grind against metal against metal. You, you, you're utilizing the seal for complete uh, type fit. Now, construction of equipment. This is a this is an area that is that is a, a very important because it really pertains to areas where you might not be in the food area, like it doesn't come in contact with with raw food or whatever, but it's in the food facility. So, what is that? And what is that? Why? What does that mean? And why is it important? Think, for example, in a bakery that you are making bagels up front and you have an allergen changer or on a regular basis, how many times do you actually go out and clean the, let's say, the, if you have a basket stacker? How many times do you clean the automation components on that basket stacker? Because those allergen dust, depending on how your facility is set up, could potentially um, sit on, on these automation components in your packaging area. And if that, if that, means that audio comes comes by and and takes a swap now you could potentially be in in some 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 uh, some complications there with the auditor and explaining so from a first perspective we have a whole line when it comes to not only uh, pneumatics but also electronics that are clean design so looking at the cylinder on the on the page you can see there's barely any uh, nooks and crannies all flat surfaces that are easy to to uh, wipe down or clean however you prefer to do so and all the little holes mounting holes you see right now can be plugged so you don't have a place for bacteria and substitute to grow uh, just another example of electrical actuator um, where all the nooks and crannies are removed to allow for easy cleanability uh, holding and conveying and manufacturing systems this is more on the on the process automation side and and 
course, we got a we as Festo offer a, a whole array of products here. But the key here is to be able to clean those process valves very, very easily and, and to maintain, make sure that you don't have materials build up in your in your process line. So if you're running, uh, for example, if you're running some sort of um, flavor line and, and, and making sure that you can clean these components, we as Festo recommend using tri-clamps where possible. This is uh, this become a big trend, especially in the baking industry. It's always been a big trend in the dairy industry, but now in the baking industry, we see the push for tri clamps, so they're easy, removable, and and cleanable, and make sure that you use sanitary ball valves, etc. In this case, in the picture, it is a pinch valve, which is probably the easiest process automation valve to clean. Literally, it, all it is is a silicone material that pinches together using compressed air, and then it expands uh, when you remove the air. But you can literally take this offline, put a new one in, and then take this one back, take the silicone material out, throw it in your wash system, put it back in, and put it back in the line. It's so easy to clean. There's no nooks and crannies inside of this component. Uh, freezer storage compartment. It is not specifically related to Festo, but it's just making sure that um, they must be, like freezers must be able to to um, maintain their, their, their measurements devices that that installed to show that temperature is accurate. This is more of a general, general um, uh, announcement. Uh, accurate position, precise instrument controls. This is an area that, that we we are we are looking forward to to how the industry is going to adapt this. So like take for example your your yeast systems, etc. Uh, that's an area where where we have seen an improvement when it comes to how to maintain. Um, Proper control with with computers, etc., and 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 sensors, and this this applies to to not not just the baking, but generally we want to make sure that we keep a good tracking like log of what what is going on in these critical items, so we can record the temperatures, pH, acidity, water, etc. Now compressed air, uh, this is an area that I think the baking industry is going to jump on right away, uh, and I say that because it it is a very easy one to um, update what you currently got on. Uh, every single machine that you buy and might or have bought likely had some sort of compressed air uh, on it, and you typically would have a like a filter on it. Now, FDA with the new food safety modification don't necessarily spec a certain requirements. They just said it must be treated, so it's left up to interpretation. But at Festo, we tend to, for North America, we tend to follow what the SQF Institute is uh, recommending, which is in this case is 0.01 micron filtration at efficiency of 99.99. So what that means, that means that you really have to filter down so there make, make sure there are no sort of foreign debris um, and, and, um, and, and solid liquid particles in that compressed air when you're blowing on, on raw product or in the food environment. So I've been talking a lot about different products. The middle of the summary here is Festo has um, a lot of products that are already been tested and utilized uh, in other industries, but we're also seeing a big uh, trend trend up in, in the baking industry, such as the air prep, as I just mentioned, um, the, the wash down manifold, the MPAC, which is in the middle of your screen, is, the, is, a, is an area topic that I see more and more focus on because people are looking for wash down and energy savings and cost reduction when it comes to machine design. So in the end, Festo has a lot of these components that we are that we have sold for many, many years, but we also utilize these for uh, jumping up for new innovations. So one item, for example, is on the upper corner, um, the VTUG. If you are going to put a manifold into a, a control box, uh, well, why not make it so that these valves are actually mounted the most efficiently, but also you don't have to cut every single individual hole in the box. This is designed to literally just cut one big hole, you put the manifold in, you plug in the airlines, but the, the seal that we provide has already been approved um, for NEMA 4X, et cetera. And, and there we have something called hot swaps where you can quickly re remove um, the actual pneumatic control valves without having to take the whole valve assembly out of the box. And, and that allows for some quicker maintenance or, or, or um, preventative maintenance task, et cetera. 
so I think Nehemiah, this is a this is this is end of my my um, yeah yes fantastic. It's really really helpful, Peter. The the I mean, it's really comprehensive overview of how these regulations and rules really apply to some of the innovations specifically that you've seen at, at Festo and um, where the industry itself can be paying attention to some of these small areas that might be uh, easy to overlook. So I, I really, we really appreciate the, the broad overview uh, and then the deep dive into some of these components that gives us a look at how these, the, this, this whole topic applies in some of the areas that we may not be familiar with. Now, um, for those of you who are uh, listening in, watching this uh, at the moment, we uh, we were able to be joined uh, by a surprise guest today. And uh, her name is uh, Gina Rio. Uh, Gina, we appreciate you being able to jump on with us. Gina has had Significant experiences you'll see through some of her her bio. She's been at Weston Foods, Mondelez, um, Cadbury, Yum Brands. Uh, very very broad experience and some very detailed experience within the food industry uh, and the bakery industry uh, as well. And Gina speaks from uh, you know 30 years plus of experience and is really for our purposes on this call. Um, uh, a an expert, kind of a subject matter matter expert for the regulation side, and we asked Gina to join us because we wanted to get a, a higher level, uh, more strategic understanding of how we can take this topic of sanitary design, hygienic design innovations. Uh, after looking at some of these things that Peter has been discussing, uh, how we can look at um, implementing some of these things within the bakery industry and just some broader perspective. So Gina, welcome. I'm glad you were able to join us. Thank you for coming on. Thank you so much, Gina. Are you, you able to hear me okay this time? <laughs> 100%, absolutely. Coming through loud Terrific. and clear. Terrific. Thank you. And I appreciate the introduction. So uh, shifting gears a little bit, I did want to talk a little bit more on the regulatory side. And I know there are a lot of concerns by bakers today on the approaches under FISMA uh, for the food safety plan or um, the HARP-C as we call it today, uh, which used to fall under the HACCP programs that were established way back when in the 60s. Um, so I don't have control of the slides. If someone could move forward, I'd appreciate it. You should be able to click, Gina. Okay, hopefully. Uh, so a little bit about FISMA and then we'll get into some broader uh, issues. So FISMA was a big game changer for the food industry. And a, a lot of what we're talking about today on hygienic design um, is considered what, what is um, called today the preventative controls or prerequisite under the um, HARP-C program. Uh, unfortunately, the FDA, because of pandemic and other issues, um, they have not published their guidance yet on sanitary design. Uh, there is an Appendix 4 that is pending. It was supposed to be published in 2018. It is still not available. Um, so everybody needs to rely on the old CFRs for now and apply it under the prerequisite section of the Food Safety Plan or the HARP-C. I'm also going to cover a little bit today on the FDA insights uh, coming out of our 483 uh, violations that are published by the FDA, which I think are very important and quite a few of them today still touch upon sanitary design and how facilities manage their um, uh, infrastructure and their uh, essential programs related to food safety. I'm then going to get into um, hygienic uh, design practices, which are considered universal, um, and they're published by a, quite a few organizations, but the most predominant is the American Meat Institute, and uh, the old GMA, which is now the Consumer Brands Association. And there are a few others as well that I'll, I'll highlight with some very appropriate checklists to help you when you're de-risking your organization. Uh, and then we're gonna get into some risk and uh, lessons learned for everybody um, so we can apply those, those uh, de-risking uh, approaches. Um, FISMA today is about prevention, as many of you know, uh, the preventive controls, 
our, our, the responsibility today of manufacturers to ensure that they have looked at potential hazards within their environment at all levels and put programs in place to mitigate or reduce or remove those hazards. And again, in the HARP C section, uh, we are going to cover uh, what those prerequisites are around sanitary design. So HARP C and FDA Food Safety Modernization Act, there are quite a few segments that have been published under FSMA, but primarily today we are going to focus on um, the preventative controls. A little bit about pre-pandemic with FDA on how they approached the new FSMA audits. Uh, they focused on high-risk food facilities with at first the enhanced GMP type audit, and then they got into preventative controls and they focused on systems and documents. What were you doing around your food safety plan to de-risk your organization? Were you doing monitoring and verification? How were your validation records, your key, kill step validation sanitation programs working? And in the beginning, quite a few of the FDA audits had inspectors take hundreds of samples of um, environmental samples, which we would call it in the industry lovingly swabathons. They would come in and set up camp and take hundreds of samples and uh, send them back to do a whole genome sequencing. And they did find quite a lot of um, conclusions with previous um, food safety recalls and incidents uh, that really sent folks for a, for a loop in the industry uh, to backtrack on, on some of those investigations. So where we stand today with the um, pandemic, um, as you know, the pandemic has pushed everything uh, to more of a remote environment. So the FDA had focused very heavily on their foreign supplier verification program during the pandemic. And the top 10 issuing um, violations under 483s, and, and for those of you that don't know, if the FDA does find something in your facility and it is not reasonably corrected while they are there, they will issue a 483. And if you have a, a food safety incident or recall, they can also issue a 483. And it's simply the number they attach to the violation under the FDA. Um, so the foreign supplier verification program was leaned on very, very heavily during um, the uh, pandemic. And the reason for that is because of the remote list of inspections. A lot of the uh, FDA inspectors did not do physical inspections. We were relying on the FISMA programs under forest supplier verification to manage that forest during the pandemic. Um, but under the top 10, five of these areas concentrate on sanitary design and hygienic pro programs. And you can see pest control, the manufacturing process and packing and um, contamination potential of foods, including allergens and micro risks, um, sanitary operations and plant maintenance, construction and design of the facility and the equipment, uh, the utensils, the maintenance of those programs, all very significant, which falls under sanitary design and how we manage and de-risk that. So uh, today's day and age, you wonder, you shake your head, how can we have things like this? Because the GMPs and uh, pest control programs and what have you have been around forever. And to have these things still pop up in food manufacturing plants is really uh, set the FDA on a course to get to the bottom of this and hold manufacturers uh, accountable. So under preventative controls, which is the approach that we use under FSMA in the food safety and the harp C program, there is focus today on the manufacturers to look at the hazards within their programs and prevent those or mitigate those from occurring. With um, the prerequisite program, which is where sanitary design would fall, um, this program would take into account your infrastructure, your utensils, your cleaning and micro and sanitation programs, what you were doing to inspect your equipment. If you're retrofitting, if you're putting new equipment in your facility or having uh, some sort of um, change control do done in your environment, how are you working into those programs, um, preventative um, approaches to help you with your HARP C? And all of that should be outlined as you're de risking and putting your food safety plan together. And along with that, training and documentation are very vital with this. The FDA will check this. Um, if you don't have uh, the pre 
the programs in place to have your uh, employees trained, uh, to have the proper sign off by your experts on the production floor and your PCQI, your, your preventative controls uh, individual that's assigned to your facility. If they're not signing off on these documents, um, you can uh, be in violation of adhering to your food safety plan. So all of these are very, very important today. And um, I also want to outline as part of the preventative controls today, um, the FDA is shifting their interest um, away from some of these basics and focusing today um, on what they're calling their closer to zero program, uh, which is the heavy metals that have come out in recent um, publications um, where the infants and toddler formulas and um, baby products have had heavy levels of lead and arsenic and other heavy metals. Uh, the FDA has come under terrific pressure, uh, started under the Trump administration and is now um, moved into the Biden administration to do something to aid in consumers' concerns around heavy metals in food products. It is expanded beyond toddlers and infants and this is a primary focus now of the FDA to make safe foods and uh, remove the contaminants and heavy metals from food products as much as possible. Although some of these things are naturally occurring, unfortunately, in some of these ingredients, um, the FDA has put a program together called Closer to Zero, and they are holding manufacturers accountable and putting it under the preventative controls program. So very important today that, again, the complexity that food manufacturers have to manage is significant under these um, now preventative control programs for FSMA. So shifting gears back to a little uh, on hygienic design, um, I believe Peter covered some of this already on the regulatory requirements. Of course, that's number one for food manufacturers. There is no guidance available yet under FSMA. The Appendix 4 is still pending, as I mentioned. Uh, and of course, manufacturers want to prevent pathogens of allergen adulteration, which is class one recall today, um, to avoid consumer illness and potential recall. Average recall today is over $10 million for manufacturers to foot that bill. So as you integrate into your um, supply chain review or your quality chain review for preventative programs, you can see in the red section, the HACCP or harp c um, under the design stage and then again under the conversion stage is, is very predominantly um, on the prerequisites for sanitary design, your utensils and equipment to design it in or make sure as you're retrofitting your facilities, you're mitigating risk along that uh, process. Um, under universal hygiene design principles, which is something that has been around quite a quite a long time and uh, fits very nicely with the CFRs and gives folks a guidance on what they need to do around uh, sanitation, wet cleaning, um, stringent standards around food production. Um, the American Meat Institute probably has one of the most stringent out there. Uh, the grocery manufacturers, which is now called the Consumer Brands Association, also came out with guidance that they pulled from uh, many, many sources and, and had an integrated approach. Um, they developed guidance and they developed checklists, which are very easy for folks to incorporate that in their risk assessment for preventative controls in their facilities. I've put links at the bottom of this slide so everybody is aware of the guidance that's available for folks. The NSF and ANSI document is a paid subscription. Uh, they've updated for 2019. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the other one that's out there, the One Voice for Hygienic Equipment Design and Low Moisture Foods, is another conglomerate from, from different uh, sources and affiliations. And predominantly with the packaging industry has put something together as well. It's a very good document and, and guidance as well. And the important piece is the checklist for everybody, which is, is built upon the 10 principles of hygienic design. And I won't go through all of these, but the 10, 10 uh, principles are here. But the most important is to make sure you have a cleanable to a micro level of anything that you have in your facility around equipment, 
around design of your infrastructure. You want to make sure that everything that you have in your facility is, is as easy as possible to, to sanitize and get down to a, a level where there are no um, pathogens and also no allergen proteins. This is a sample of the, the, um, um, the scoring around the 10 principles uh, checklist um, that I provided just to give you an example of what one of them looks like. <coughs> Excuse me, when you go through the checklist itself, um, you will put a rating system in there and it will also reference um, the guidance documents as well. So you can refer to the actual um, number of the guidance for each one of these sections to understand what they're looking at when they say, what is an at-risk hollow piece of equipment? Or is there a niche or pooling water on a piece of equipment? Is the equipment located that you're concerned with over a food contact surface? Um, do you have backflow protection? Um, is the height of the equipment off the floor sufficient to get in it to access cleaning in a, in a good manner? Um, is there a, a ice buildup? on your freezers and these spirals going from the hot and cold environment uh, because the ice is just as bad as having pooling water on your pieces of equipment. So you need to look at all of that as you go through and there's, there's significant guidance on all of that to make it easier for you to um, implement that. Um, again, the checklist, you should incorporate that in your risk review when you're doing your food safety plan, your harp c and make sure it's reviewed by a, a cross-functional team uh, and you also incorporate, as I mentioned, change controls. If you're doing a large process uh, project in your environment on the on the floor, have you figured in all the uh, the, the new um, changes that may happen on the floor that may impact how you're sanitizing or handling your food products? And you should have policy around how you approach hygienic design in your facilities. And then it should be reviewed at different stages you know, prior to um uh, scoping out the equipment um when you're working on getting the equipment with the uh, supplier to work out any um uh, uh, subjective needs that you may have in your particular environment approvals and also if you can work it into your your po's and um and make sure that um everything um fits into your documentation plan as well because everything must be documented and signed off today uh as a requirement of FISMA. This is just an example of a hygienic design uh, continuous improvement cycle, um, the continuum from designing the, the uh, situation that you may need in your environment, a plan, a monitoring, and usually people put KPIs through, through that as well so they could track improvements. And then improvements, making sure if you have something in place that you think is working for an improvement, you're verifying and validating those uh, improvements as well. Validation is something that the uh, FDA, if they come in and do an inspection, will look for uh, validation proof, including third-party lab testing um, on particular items. So if you're sanitizing, removing pathogens and allergens, sending products out or testing samples out to third-party labs and making sure that your programs are working effectively. So some takeaways, <clears throat> you wanna make sure uh, today that you're meeting the needs for an FDA inspection, which they're doing more enhanced GMPs today and full um, GMP per, uh, preventative control inspections. And now since the pandemic has kind of um, moved forward, the FDA is doing unannounced visits again. They were scheduling only on a needed basis in the past during the pandemic. They're back to making unannounced visits. Um, your preventative control audits need to have um, detailed um, documentation and programs and your risk assessments for your HARP-C uh, in place. Um, there are some other dates that things kicked in uh, because the pandemic, again, was prolonged, uh, intentional adulteration, uh, as long as you have a food defense plan in place right now, uh, it kicked in in July. They are holding off with holding facilities accountable. Um, probably until 2021 at this play at this point, um, because the prolonged pandemic has has forced them to just um, hold off on on the um, uh, keeping folks accountable for now. Um, the FDA is also focusing on some key areas that they feel that uh, facilities didn't 
do a satisfactory job on improvement. That is around the um, 483, as I mentioned already. So sanitation, cross-contact or contamination, especially in ready-to-eat areas, cross-contact contamination for allergens. Uh, and everybody is aware the new sesame allergen has been added to the top eight. When you now have a top nine, uh, they're going to be enforcing that in 2023. Uh, so folks need to gear up and get ready for that. Uh, training and documentation is vital, uh, as well as controlling listeria and salmonella and ready to eat foods. And they are looking and focusing on zoning and your maintenance of equipment and your facility infrastructure. So there's your sanitary design again. And with that, Peter, I'll turn over and wait. I don't know where you want to go from here. So I really appreciate that, Gina. I, you did, you, you touched on some of the areas that Peter had mentioned uh, at the beginning, but you, uh, you really uh, fleshed it out for our audience and really helped us understand some of the areas that are going to be key and critical in uh, in understanding. Um, you know, we're 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 here at the top of our uh, at the at the top of the hour, and uh, we've we've run out of time for this portion of the webinar. Uh, what I want our audience to know is that the presentations, both that Gina provided, uh, as well as that Peter provided. Um, will be available um, if you will just send a request to the organizer of this webinar. Uh, in fact, Gina mentioned uh, 10 principles of sanitary hygienic design, and she actually goes into detail into each one of them to try to give some really uh, key ideas for understanding each of these, um, each of these principles. So I think what we'll do is we'll um, we have these key these success takeaways. I think what I'll do is uh, um, Gina, if you don't mind, if we can just include these in the presentation document that is being made available to our organizers. And I'm fine with that. Mm -hmm. That that would be great. And then we can um, include these in those documents. Uh, but for the time being, if there are no, I I, I don't believe there was any questions. Uh, to this point. So uh, Gina and Peter, really, really appreciate your investment in these overviews. Uh, to those who have attended, really, uh, really hope that there was enough value. Uh, there was a significant amount of value here, Gina and Peter. So thank you for uh, investing in so deeply in these presentations to give our audience something to take away. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for, for the opportunity. If you'd like to get in touch with Gina, uh, her contact information is on the screen. Uh, Peter Asmussen is on uh, LinkedIn. And if you would like his contact information, uh, we can provide that to you upon request uh, if you reach out to the organizers of this webinar. Uh, I, that's, that is all from uh, my standpoint. Elena, is there any last words you do, that you'd like to mention before we wrap things up? No, I just want to thank everyone again today for joining. For those who want to share the webinar, it will be publicly available on the FPSA website as well as over our social media platforms. So stay tuned for those links to be posted live. So feel free to share. Um, and again, if you want to reach out to Peter or Gina, uh, Gina's contact information is on the screen and Peter's uh, LinkedIn profile is on the event page where you can just directly click on his, pro on his bio and, and connect with him. Well, thank you very much, Elena. Thank you all again for attending, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Bye. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.